and uh, we'll start uh, the conversation. And um, again, this is a very organic conversation, a community uh, driven conversation. Uh, and again, I just want to quickly welcome you all uh, to this uh, event uh, brought to you by Communication Leadership Graduate Program at University of Washington in partnership with Center for uh, Journalism, Media and Democracy that one of our panelists is a co-director for also at the University of Washington. Um, this is um, very quickly an event that we uh, thought about uh, putting together uh, thanks to our lovely community faculty and alumni who stepped in to reflect on the moment and to make sense of it all from the very perspectives we bring uh, uh, from a scholarship to practice in our program and to make it available to a broader community as we try to make sense of a very complex uh, political process that's ongoing in the US that is not unlike, that will be my point, uh, of other places around the world. Um, I'm, um, I will be introduced later on, but very quickly, I'm Ekin Yeshin, I'm the director of the program, um, and I'm joined by many who uh, are um, uh, basically lead and facilitator today, Austin Jenkins will introduce. Um, so I wanna start our event by introducing Austin to you, who's an alumni of our program, but not only an alumni of our program, but also a political reporter based in Olympia, Washington, uh, and is uh, a part of Northwest News uh, Network. Um, so I will turn, over, turn it over to Austin to say a little bit more about the event and about us and about the structure of the day, uh, but we're very excited for all of you to join us. And I'm very much looking forward to thinking about this moment with all of you. Thank you, Akin. It is a um, very rainy and blustery afternoon down here in Olympia. I'm hoping the power doesn't go off, but if I disappear, someone will have to step in and moderate this in my absence. It's happened before. Um, and thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. I think this is a very, very timely conversation to be have it, having. We've, we've named this our post-election survival guide to navigating polarization. Polarization does not go away after this election, that's for sure. Uh, so let me just start out by introducing our panelists and we'll get right to this. Um, and you just heard from uh, Dr. Akin Yashin, who is the director of the Communication uh, Leadership Program, um, an expert uh, on organizational culture, organizational storytelling, building communities and thought leadership. Um, currently residing in Turkey, uh, from Turkey originally. She really brings a global perspective to our conversation today. Um, Jody Ann Beery is a writer, a podcast host and creator and instructor now in the Com Lead program. I see several of people who are taking your class, Jody Ann, who are, who are tuning in this noon hour. Um, and, and that's just naming a few of many roles uh, she has. Her mission is to disrupt business as usual to achieve social change with a focus on underrepresented communities. Jody Ann brings a number of perspectives to today's conversation, including how polarization is impacting the push for racial equality in this country. Uh, professor, professor Adrian Russell is a professor of communication, also the associate director of the Center for Communication and Civic Engagement. Her research focuses on the digital age evolution of activist communication and journalism and explores communication related to climate change and social justice. She brings both a media and activism perspective to our conversation today. So our moderated conversation will last for about 45 minutes. And then for the last 15 minutes, we will reserve time for your questions and the panelists answers. However, do feel free throughout the first 45 minutes to use the Q&A dialogue box. I will endeavor to monitor it and try to work your questions into the conversation as we go. But we will have time in the last 15 minutes to have more of an exclusive Q&A where I step back a little bit. Um, okay, as a jumping off point, I, I want to give each of our guests, each of our panelists an opportunity to help us frame today's conversation from their perspective. We've titled this again, a post-election survival guide to navigating polarization. And so my question to the panel, and I'll start with you, Ken, is when you hear the word polarization, what does it prompt for you? And how do you think we should be thinking about that word and contextualizing it in this polarized time that we live in? Um, I, I thank you, Austin, again. Um, and my answer is uh, twofold. I think polariz I think of polarization as a kind of, I mean, it's a manifold uh, phenomenon. I think all our participants will unleash different aspects of it. But for me, 
uh, first and foremost, it's a global phenomenon. I think it's a, it unleashes the need for us to understand ourselves um, in a global context. And I wanted to kind of quickly share with you all what polarization means for me. As Austin mentioned, I'm currently in Turkey. I watched the uh, unfolding of the US elections uh, for the first time in the country I grew up but haven't been uh, living in for the past, uh, well, more than 20 years. Don't want to reveal my age. No, I'm joking. You can private chat me for that one. But um, but it was a very interesting experience for me because I was literally experiencing something from a different context, uh, the dual context that I'm part of. But I'm usually a part of one or the other, uh, not experiencing one in the distance uh, as strongly as I have this past week during the election. And in that way. Um, it was really interesting for me to experience this election um, in Turkey and to also monitor the responses within Turkey to the US election. Uh, for us in particular in Turkey, this was very alike and a, a very much a moment and the unfolding that follows uh, this past week is a very familiar moment. Um, there has been um, a party, a, one party leading Turkey since 2002 that has been the sole um, kind of uh, holder of power since that time. Um, so for two decades now. Um, and uh, the very kind of uh, changes, in, um, changes in tactics, changes in systems, uh, contesting of results, uh, speculations of rigging, uh, let it be true or not. Um, and then uh, conversations around feeling defeated or feeling like you won has been a part of our reality. Uh, for many folks uh, in Turkey, um, and I've often given uh, the example of my late mother, uh, who unfortunately in her lifetime have never um, actually moved beyond the feeling of defeated. Uh, she always wished for it. She always had very particular feelings against uh, the system that we're under and how it's changing for her to never feel like there was an option. And uh, that was her kind of uh, uh, discontent uh, with the political system and the polarization itself. Uh, the fact that she was made to feel defeated every day, right? So, uh, so in that global context, there's everyday lived experience that we can borrow from. And I'm part of that. And I'm kind of experiencing this moment uh, from that context throughout the election. Also, there was a lot of conversation again about how this very particular election was very much like some elections in recent history in Turkey. Um, in the past two decades, we had only one election where the opposing parties um, su succeeded. And that was a recent 2019 local election that actually uh, were many would have speculated from one side was tried to be rigged by the party in power uh, and went to a rerun uh, to have the opposing party for the first time even win the rerun which gave everyone a brief glimmer of hope but a lot of kind of also again exposed uh, the duality of narratives duality of stories duality of communication tactics and that's within Turkey and in Turkey we I have this experience, I think for many of us, uh, particularly journalists and academics, for them, this feeling of defeat, of course, is not just this everyday feeling of like navigating family and work conversations, but with dire consequences of your livelihood, where signing a petition or saying something on air would result in your ability to travel, would end you up in jail. Uh, we are not probably one of the top countries of uh, the, uh, the number of journalists in jail. Uh, that has been um, a, a while on coming, but particularly in this period heightened, just to also preserve uh, some of those narratives in the strength that the, uh, the part that's in power wants to preserve. Permeating feelings of defeat and win, I think is something about uh, polarization as well. Uh, right now, uh, due to the election results in, in the US, some may be feeling like they won, some may be feeling like they're defeated, but then that feeling lasting a while, right? It's not just a consequential policy or political outcome. I think also is a global phenomenon. And that's what polarization means for me too, creating these shared global realities of creating uh, sustained um, feelings of polarized feelings and sentiments across the globe. And again, I mentioned Turkey because I am there uh, but I was like quickly jotting down notes uh, for this conversation, Austin, it's everywhere and it's across time, right? So the time and space is something that I think we should be very 
prepared for uh, to understand polarization collectively. Um, just in the past few years, um, I can think of the Brexit vote uh, for UK to leave EU and leave and remain sides, 51% to 48.11% um, leave side, quote unquote, winning. I don't wanna use those terms. Um, uh, Brazil, uh, the the emergence of uh, Jair Bolsonaro, um, who actually came to power because of a systemic change of how people get elected in uh, particular, something to do with local uh, politics or in Italy, uh, the right wing movement uh, following Silvio Berlusconi was a media mogul. I'm just mentioning these or in more recently, I'm celebrating the return of Evo Morales of Bolivia, the first indigenous leader of the country who was ousted um, again by a, um, by a rhetoric around uh, rigging of elections, et cetera, and, uh, and having to leave his country. Um, so he returned this week due to a return, a flip of uh, the results. This is just to say, for me, polarization is a global phenomenon uh, that impacts everyday feelings. Uh, and those feelings last a long time. Um, and making sense of those feelings collectively and globally is really, really, really important. Well, and that global perspective to me is such a good way to start this off because it is, it's very easy to just think about this from where you sit in, in your own experience and to sort of scale this to the globe really helps, I think, to start us off. So thank you for that. Uh, Jody Ann Beery, what, why don't we hear from you next? And if, if you want, I can prompt you again, but it's really that question of what, when you hear the word polarization, um, what does it mean to you, especially at this time and at this moment in our history? Yeah, thank you so much, Austin. Um, and thank you again. I just love your global perspective and bringing in um, over time, over the world, what's happening. It's not unique. We're not in a, in a special place. And I, I think I want to build that into my own answer as well. And so when I think about polarization, the first thing I think about are the magnets. I know, I've, I'm sure people have played with magnets in school, right? <laughs> then you get the North Pole and the South Pole together and you're like, oh, you're trying to get them and it doesn't work. Like, let me see in the chat, people who have tried to like force the North and South Poles together, right? And it just doesn't happen. And I think that's where we are as a country right now. We are polarized, that is a fact. I don't know if we need to see that as something that needs to be, um, fixed in some way like I want to interrogate that like do we automatically assume polarization to be something that's negative something that needs to be remedied I'm not 100% there you know currently yes tiny a little a little bit less than half of the country a little bit less than half the country voted for Trump Biden about 74 million Trump about 70 million and these are not just like different people but these are fundamentally different ideologies and the differences between who's going for who is less than half the size of the population of Manhattan, okay? So a really, really small fraction of people between this. So absolutely we are polarized. What does this say? You know, I think when we think about our communication environment and the messaging and narratives that are happening right now, you know, I pulled from Biden's speech where he says, quote, the Bible tells us that to everything there is a season. My mom has says, says this all the time, to everything there is a season. He says, a time to build, a time to reap, a time to sow, and a time to heal. Heal? How are we healing when a little bit less than half of the country looked at an environment of corruption, fascism, post-facts, post-science, the emboldenment of white supremacy, mass incarceration, a gag rule on critical race theory, military tactics being used against its own citizens. A little less than half the country looked at that and said, eh, I mean, it's not disqualifying. How do you heal when this other pole is looking at you and wanting your existence um, to be erased once you're not in this country, once you're not to get married, once you're not to have kids, once you're not to have health care. How do you heal? And so when I think about, you know, back to Biden's, you know, quotation from the Bible about time to reap, a time to sow, well, 
the seeds of white supremacy, you know, as we and discrimination and fascism that has been kind of brewing forever and getting bigger and stronger from Obama's presidency for his eight years, coming, you know, poking through the concrete during Trump. And this is, we are sowing, we are reaping what we've sowed in the past. We, we are reaping what has happened around the historical systemic racism, discrimination in this country, right? That is, that is how we got Trump. So in the absence of Trump, and those ideologies, using Trump as like the symbol of those ideologies, those ideologies persist. You know, Brittany Packnett Cunningham wrote in the Time Magazine today that Trump will not take systemic oppression with him when he packs up in January. And millions of our neighbors don't want to see it go. How do we heal? And so when I think about this magnet and we are definitely at that place where we're not, is not going to happen. I cannot look at someone who thinks that, you know, racism isn't real, that my experiences are invalid and heal and mend with that person or that ideology or the system that allows that to thrive. That is not going to come together. But what's also cool about that magnet test in middle school, right? <laughs> Is that as you try to get those opposite poles closer and closer together, sometimes it slides out, it goes to the side. And I think that's what's really exciting about as we think forward of how can new factions, new identities emerge with some viability. You know, we have a progressive left that has a base. We have new ideologies that are taking hold. I think people are wanting to find maybe their own past in some way. And I think that's really exciting that we're having different, more nuanced conversations in our public discourse in a way that we didn't have before. And so what I'm hoping that we can reap from these past four years and this polarization is an opportunity to bring a little bit more nuance in our public conversations. And what I also hear you saying is this may not be a static situation and that, that we're in this moment now, but we may not, it may look very different in five or 10 years down the road. Um, thank you for that. And um, I keep thinking about with the magnets, you know, are they, is it, is it different poles that people are on or is it completely different planets <laughs> we're on? Um, and, and yet we share the same planet, right? I mean, that's the reality. And in this case, share the same country. So um, it, it makes it all the more complex. Uh, we're not residing on, on, separate, on separate planets or on separate magnets, even though it feels like it. Um, but that's such a great analogy. And thank you as a visual th thinker, I thank you for that. Um, Professor Adrian Russell. Uh, you and I, you know, I think connect on the looking at this through the lens of journalism, and how journalism is evolving. But again, I'll pose the same question to you. Polarization in this time, what does it prompt for you? How do you think we ought to be thinking about it and contextualizing it? Yeah, I mean, I want to just pick up right on what Jody Ann is talking about, because I think that one of the questions, and then I'll circle back to journalism and our communication environment and how I mean, how polarization is exacerbated with the current situation we have. But J Jody Ann's point that, um, you know, we may, how can we be at a time of healing when we, um, you know, have been enduring uh, denialism, racism, uh, uh, acceptance of, you know, complete, abandonment of the infrastructures of our democracy. Um, and I don't say that to be polarizing. I say that to sort of pose the question of ourselves as communicators, as you know, all of the presumably people here today are interested in professional communication. So the, my question around polarization is how do we bridge differences without pandering to racism and to denialism and to um, you know just outright falsehoods. And if we can't do that, should we be trying to do something else? 
like pick up on the thread of the opportunities for these different conversations and strengthening those conversations so that we can bring people along, um, you know, just like Black Lives Matter has been doing, right? Or, you know, uh, another example is that, you know, one of the, the things that I think we can really learn from in this polarized environment is climate communication in part because they, people interested in truthful, effective climate communication and action have been in this swamp of disinformation for longer than the rest of us, right? Um, you know, they, it's been decades and decades that they've been up against these think tanks and, you know, major industry money pouring into lies and falsehoods and harassment of their representatives. Um, so then we see it, you know, happening with regard to COVID. Now we see it with regard to the elections. So the question is, to me, back to your original question, Austin, to me, when I hear polarization, I think about the question of how is journalism and also larger media infrastructure, social media, um, and, you know, the platforms that are not doing a good job of regulating their content and that are sidestepping regulation and policy, how do they contribute to exacerbating it? And as communication professionals and practitioners, how can we identify solutions to hold journalists accountable and to point to best practices, to you know, be able to bridge differences without uh, compromising our own values and, and morals? Um, and so that's what I think about because I don't know that I'm a very, I, 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 I never know how to feel or think when people say like, you know, just put aside your differences and it's fine. Because I don't really feel that way, even though uh, I feel a professional pull to, towards being able to say that I do or to be able to know how to act that way without compromising my own ethics, I guess. So that's my answer. <laughs> Well, and it, it it prompts for me this question of of the role of the modern media, at least in this country, and especially in I mean the Trump presidency altered how the media engages, um, but we also are seeing um, the influence of young black journalists um, coming into newsrooms and 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 going back to certainly Ferguson in twenty fourteen Ferguson Missouri in twenty fourteen, but but more recently saying you know, media today is not reflective of the values of that, that they, that their, of their lived experience and what they're requiring of, of the entities, the news organizations they're working for. So you, but where I would sort of want to take this next is, is this idea of an iceberg to use another visual. And we have a question on the, on the Q and A here about the role of social media. And so I want to ask about that, but I also want to ask you about it in the context of if social media is sort of the tip of the iceberg and we see that, but I think underneath that is a eroded trust in institutions, which Akin referred to a, a moment ago. How do we, I think it's easy to blame social media. So let me ask you the question, how are we keeping social media companies accountable for influencing this conversation around polarization? How can we, and what are your thoughts? But the context also is, are we putting too much on social media? And maybe we're not getting beneath the surface to deal with what's sort of underpinning that, and maybe Ken, you could start. Oh, for sure, and I, I think to, um, today my role is to bring in the global perspective, and I'll let uh, uh, the rest of our uh, participants also to bring in others too. But um, I mean, for me, um, so in our program too, as Adrian mentioned, we work with a number of uh, you who are and or future participants who work with such companies or who aspire to work with such companies. And these companies morphed in the past decade and have an uh, unprecedented uh, role and power. Um, and they are international, right? So um, they, uh, they operate. So in, in the case of the US elections, still a global perspective, foreign um, entities can participate in the information dissemination or sharing or commenting process on in social media of those who are in the US. So um, so it, these are kind of really large and um, not necessarily properly untempered with, of course, there's international legislation around them. Uh, 
things that are in our lives. Um, and they play a huge role, uh, right, in the prep to the election this particular election, uh, of course, some of these companies said they were better prepared than before to kind of mark this information, even if it came from politicians um, and uh, tried to kind of target, but still the basic structure of it all was still there. And the very uh, structure that would actually uh, overlook it or control it is not there. Um, today um, in, um, across the globe, um, actually governments, um, and again, I totally agree with uh, both Jody Ann's and Adrian's perspective about uh, kind of trying to figure out if polarization is a permanent state, but then kind of understanding uh, different kind of forms of polarization. Um, it's very much the case um, that there are governments who have social media arms, who post this information to sustain uh, official, by the way, jobs, right? In the US, maybe uh, the former, the incumbent president has done that, uh, took over that job, but there are actual people whose job is to either monitor or to post information uh, in such platforms. So to imagine it as just this happy-go-lucky place of connecting is not, well, hasn't been for a very long time an apt way of understanding uh, these entities. Um, so um, so I, I, my answer is to create systems um, uh, to, um, and also to not give um, just an individual who holds the power of these entities that much power. Um, it, it's uh, kind of nonsensical to me to imagine that one one CEO or one 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 person would have power within these companies as well when they hold such global impact in the political processes. Um, indeed, they have accountability mechanisms, but we we have to think about their structure and role in our global everyday lives and how they impact all these processes and how they've been kept away from the political process at a large part. So how to make sense of that is at the top of my agenda at this moment in the time. Jody Ann or Adrian, what, what is this prompt for you? I'll pivot to you, Adrian. Um, well, I'll go back to your, your comment, Austin, about um, you know, eroding trust, because of course we can point to social media platforms and uh, blame them for the bad behavior of their users, right? Um, or their bad behavior and not stopping it. Um, and certainly I think we all know by now that it's not a glitch in the system that these things are happening. The loudest, most extreme content gets the most play and that's how the most money is made. So there's no mystery around that. But the question is why, why do masses of people not believe in facts or in institutions that were designed to uphold uh, you know, democracy? And I think the answer is not that mysterious. I mean, there have been uh, there, the income inequities and the abuses around the world that people face by their governments directly or indirectly um, is pretty damning. And, you know, when we first gained, you know, widespread access to the internet, you know, protests went way up when people started recognizing that you could resist and getting more information about the graft going on in their political systems, people wanted to push back against that. So it's not like a big mystery that people don't trust institutions. The question is how do we reform institutions so they deserve our trust again? And so that, you know, when it comes to journalism, how do we, um, you know, create practices of journalism that include being completely not a megaphone for racist ideologies, for one. You know, journalism functions on all these assumed uh, norms, right? Uh, you know, pedophilia is bad. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein was bad. There's all these things that we've agreed upon are bad. Why not income inequality? Why not racism? Why not, uh, you know, lies coming from the highest office? I mean, it's, we're moving in that direction, but uh, so I do, I really agree with you that the problem isn't, uh, or the biggest problem isn't social media platforms. The biggest problem is 
a complete disconnection between our institutions of governance and of information and you know the trust and the will of the people to abide by and believe in them. And that's such an interesting point that just rebuilding trust in the same old existing institutions isn't going to work in order to get the trust back those institutions, including journalism and media, are going to have to change. So, exactly. So Jody, or, yeah. And I or just want to if that with this idea, because I know it's, an, it's something that you're talking about as well, is sort of this amnesia we have in this country. And so, as much as we're looking to the to the future, I also want us to to root this in some history. Yeah. Thank you for that. Like you know, when we were discussing earlier around, you know, the United States has a, a chronic case of amnesia where we like to forget the things that happened you know 400 years ago or four days ago right this erasure of the harms that continue to exist in our lives not every day but this historical inertia of how that has impacted us for generations and so that i think is really really important and you don't need to erase um this idea that not all communities have trust in institutions you know, when I was in the hospital, I had a cancer diagnosis a couple years ago, I was reflecting on how grateful I was to be Black. Like, I am so happy that I'm a Black immigrant woman because inherently in that, I know that institutions were not created for my benefit at all. And so that creates this thing in me where I question everything. And if I didn't question everything, I wouldn't have found my tumor when my doctors were telling me that I was fine. And so when I think about social media, when I think about our information environment and our institutions of who gets to control the narratives, black and brown communities do not necessarily have this inherent trust in institutions because we know how those institutions were created and what our um, intended role was in them, right? You know, Michelle Obama spoke to this, to live in a house that were built by slaves, right? Like we're constantly living in this duality and, um, this multifacetedness of our identities and how we trust information. And so when I think about the social media environment and our institutional environment, our institutions are gatekeepers and have been gatekeepers to the voices of black and brown people, of women, of people who have been marginalized. And so when I look to social media, that is actually the space where I feel that I can find more trust where I find my like virtual neighbors who can tell me, you know, the hot gossip of what's going on in our communities. Like I trust those spaces more. And then every once in a while, when these gates open, you know, to Roxanne Gay or Jelani Cobb or Kianga Yamata Taylor and other powerful voices to be able to write their perspectives, then I can read the New York Times, then I can read the New Yorker, then I can try to listen a little bit more because the gate has been open just a little bit for black and brown voices, for voices that aren't part of the, the, the structure really of this institution. However, and I'm sure Adrian, you can speak to this, is that when you have some type of marginalized identity and you are within these institutions, right, in these newsrooms, there's a way sometimes that you can participate in your own manipulation or you participate in your own oppression where you start censoring yourself, where you start telling different stories because these people pay you. So when I look to a social media environment, I know that when I look at some of these platforms, these are these people who I trust, who I follow, who um, are, are scholars, who are experts in this field, who are in an unfiltered space where maybe I can find something that resonates with my experiences, that resonate with my ideology, that, you know, can open me up a little bit more to think differently, you know, about this own work. I think it was Adrienne Marie Brown wrote this really, really beautiful, long blog, I think just on her own platform, challenging cancel culture. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know about this because I'm a cancel culture fan, but here's this black queer woman who's trying to lay it down a different perspective. Okay, let me buy into that a little. Let me read that. What could that work look like if she was relying on the gatekeeping around these institutions that have existed and were created to quiet her voice? So I don't think that social media is a, a bad space. I don't think, and it, trust me, it can be an awful space. It's a space where 
um, our polarized environment where not only um, folks within our own country, but foreign entities have been leveraging that, specifically attacking like black and brown people to get them to go to places or get mis misinform them intentionally. However, it is also the space where I know that I can find the nuance of narratives of voices that don't often have a space in these institutions. Yeah, and that's the duality of it, which makes it so very complex, but it, it does also, I think you're driving home this idea that it's so easy to, to say that you know, social media is the problem or it's amplifying the voices of hate. It is doing those things. It may even be inciting violence at times, absolutely. But there is this other coin of the realm and certainly in journalism, as I was alluding to before, a lot of reporters of color found a voice in social media and you've just stated, you know, spoken to this, that when they were working in the halls of, of majority white news organizations and working for those employers never had that voice until now. And so we have to live with and wrestle, I think, with, with both of these realities and, and learn to navigate it. You know, we promised some practical, I think in the, in the, the title of this, of this noontime uh, conversation, we promised some practical advice. And so I do want to get to a question that Heather uh, Workel brought into the, into the question and answer page, which is, as we're, so now that we've sort of laid this foundation, what are some tips, she asked, for for those of us who are continuing to have conversations across the partisan lines. And in this particular case, Heather says, you know, having a conversation with a Trump supporter who keeps insisting that these are just political differences. It's no different than, you know, a conversation you might have with somebody on the other side of the aisle 25 years ago. How do you meet people if you are gonna meet them on that, op on that polar opposite magnet? And, and Jody Ann, maybe, maybe start with you. Yeah, so when we think about the fundamentals of communication, right, you have the sender, you have the receiver, you have the message, then you have noise, right, which changes the message once it gets to the receiver and with that feedback loop, right. And so I think a practical tip is to really understand what is your noise, what are the things that maybe when you're sharing a message, it can um, get muddied once it reaches your receiver, or when you're hearing a message, you're not totally hearing it. What is the noise to you? Is it your emotions? Is it your own biases? Is it your misinformation or lack of knowledge in certain areas? And sometimes you can use those things that make you uncomfortable, use the things that make you mishear something as a guide for further education. Um, I think generally human beings, we are uncomfortable when we hear something that we disagree with, <laughs> which makes sense. Um, but I think it's important to know why you disagree with that thing. And maybe that can help you hear things a little bit more. Another, um, it's hard to call this practical advice because it itself is so imaginary and, and kind of um, conceptual. But just thinking about you know, Robin D.G. Kelly talks about freedom dreams. And I've been in this space where I feel like, you know, our collective, you know, radical imaginations of what could be possible have, are reaching new possibilities right now. I think there are new openings because we're having different nuanced conversations. And so can we focus on what is the thing that we want I would really love my student loan debt to be canceled. I would really love, you know, not just healthcare for myself, but for everyone, particularly as we're navigating a pandemic. I want people to be educated. I want people to have, you know, financial opportunities. I want, you know, what are the things that you want? And I think that's where we can stay focused on what is the dream? What is the freedom dream? Can you meet me at, you know, at education for preschoolers, you know? Can you meet me at the fact that it is, you know, the reprehensible that almost 700 kids have no idea where their parents are? Can you meet me there? And stay focused on what is the actual vision for what you want. I think that'll help navigate the conversations that you're having, um, maybe conversations you might be having as the holidays come up and are coming face to face, you know, virtually or otherwise with people who might think very differently than us. Yeah, that 
And I love that, that framing around the holidays because they are coming. Of course, we all have to keep our safe distances, but this is gonna be a time of the year that brings people together right after the election at this incredibly polarized time. And, and that's even happening in the virtual world, just with family Zoom conversations that are fracturing because of this. And, and in some ways, you know, that's what we have to navigate first and foremost is our own family dynamics. And then you sort of build out from there. Um, akin, you know, this is the first time in my lifetime that I've heard people actually talk about the potential for a civil war in this mm -hmm. country. And mm -hmm. some have said, you know, better to be fighting it out on social media verbally or, you know, in whatever you write than to actually pick, you know, taking up arms. But as you think about practical advice, and also, again, from that global perspective, does it seem like we are in the precipice in this country of something like that? Is that hy hyperbolic? Gra maybe you can ground us here. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, um, again, um, not to undermine the, the very many structures that undermine people that actually leads to a very particular experience of polarization for some more so than others, where there again, livelihoods and being are a threat. So leaving that aside, and which I think we have to deal with urgently, which I, I actually, I think, targets specific uh, groups of individuals. Um, in, in the US, this is black and brown individuals uh, uh, in, across history and, and trying to make sense of it all um, at this moment, at this time is a particular endeavor. But having said that, uh, a systemic failure or a civil war um, have not necessarily been, well, versions of, <laughs> less overt versions of that have been the case in global context. So what happens though, that I see in the US uh, that is like other places, as opposed to war, more um, small scale system changes, uh, more shying away from conversation when those systems are being changed. So that in the next cycle, those nuanced policies or uh, how people can vote or, um, or, or rules around something has been changed by someone who feels like they're undermined in a polarized system and have a particular power. So I um, so in that way, uh, along the years in Turkey and I think um, others in elsewhere have learned to follow multiple layers of kind of what's going on uh, to not just protect us, but to understand the structure of change. So I, I'm not worried necessarily about a case of a civil war, but I'm worried about kind of a long-term agenda unfolding that would still leave uh, the same populations that are suffering at this moment at disadvantage, that would still try to sustain certain aspects of a system uh, that are problematic in the long term. And that has happened in Turkey. It's kind of have been a, a closing in and for professional and uh, communication professionals, I think we're at a very formative moment. In Turkey now, I consult with uh, professional communication organizations in Turkey. Uh, whenever we're at a place, we try to kind of shy away and whisper uh, our discontent. Uh, but we're in a particular context, again, um, kind of like the system has no uh, openings for such discontent to be voiced. But we talk more about the environment, less about our local politics or, or certain policies or what's going on in Turkey now, because we can't. Um, so uh, um, I, I also think that um, understanding what our goal is and understanding what we should be talking about and what should, we, what should we be finding better ways to talk about with different constituents is really important. So I do not think, Austin, that we're going towards necessarily a scenario where two sides will actually uh, go into war, but they're going to use different communication tactics, the particular leadership rhetoric that will point them towards those tactics. So we have to be hyper vigilant in our, um, in our understanding of what those tactics are and in our listening, observing uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe communication practices. Um, so it's more vital now than ever. And this seems, this is um, I think such a, a warning in a way you're issuing, issuing which is that small incremental change can happen over time. It goes unnoticed and then wham. One day you wake up and 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 so something has profoundly changed, and 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 people have been working behind the scenes to make that change without 
people being any wiser to it. So Adrian, this makes me, I often think about the role, almost the idea that we have been programmed in this country to be consumers before we are citizens. And that maybe this is an opportunity to, to re-engage as citizens and to think first and foremost of ourselves as citizens as opposed to consumers. I don't know if that takes you in a direction that you were thinking about, but if it does, why don't you take it away? Yeah, I mean, there's, I'm looking also, there's some questions in the, um, in the chat. One of them is from my colleague Leilani, who's asking, okay, sure, how do we reform our institutions to deserve, deserve our trust, right? Um, and this actually speaks to, I think, what you're asking, which is that so many of our institutions are, are set up um, as commercial endeavors, our media environment, but also like our electoral process, campaigning, politics. Um, and so I do think it has to go hand in hand. It's not entirely a question of how we can be like, okay, let's snap out of it and stop uh, like ordering cool things on Amazon to make COVID isolation go by easier and get involved in our local community group, right? Because we don't even have the pathways a lot of us to know how it is to change our existence from consumers to engage citizens. Um, you know, there's so many barriers to that for so many communities. Um, so I do think that that would be a fantastic solution. Um, and I do think this also speaks to us thinking about the ways that um, our existing technologies could be leveraged in order to support that rather than preclude that. Um, and so I, that's why those sorts of conversations and those sorts of questions are the ones that I try to focus on. Like a lot of my work uh, has to do with how activists use technology to uh, like, you know, their benefit to the benefit of their causes, social justice causes. And the reason why I like to do that is because you can pinpoint moments where technology is being used not for commercial purposes, but for social justice ends. And a lot of times people are super innovative in doing that. And I mean, you know, hashtag activism and Black Lives Matter is like the cliched example of that. But, but truly in an era where we talk a lot about commercialism and the degradation of the public sphere due to extremism on social networks, we've also achieved all these huge and you know, sort of structural rattling movements. Um, and I think if we see these examples and we take careful notice of how that happens, then we can start to replicate that and start finding other avenues for using the tools that we have towards these more beneficial ends. Um, I know that's a very vague answer, but that's all I got. <laughs> That's great. And I do want to invite because we are now at 1250. And um, if you have a question, please put it in the, the Q&A uh, box. Prefer that to the chat if possible. And, and I wrote that down, hashtag activism. Uh, Jody Ann, I want to ask you about if somebody is feeling like post-election that they want to take their activism beyond hashtags and sort of what is the next step what does allyship look like? Um, where I, you know, you 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 have talked about the uh, the lessons learned from the Obama era, which then followed the Trump era, and the significance of Senator Kamala Harris now becoming the vice president elect, and just pausing with that moment and thinking about how so many want her to be, you know, kind of represent everything at once. What, what's the sort of warning you would issue? and perhaps the challenge you might issue around getting past hashtag activism? Um, yeah, so I, again, I have to be a little contrarian here. I don't know if we, we are dealing with systemic oppression and discrimination. And when something happens systemically, you need multifaceted approaches. You need a really dynamic, 
multi-directional, multi-level approach to eradicating that discrimination from our system. And so I don't think it's a matter of getting beyond the hashtag activisms because it is the hashtags that even got us here in the first place. And so I think it's a both and. There's a definite strong space for social media activism, period, point blank, right? And also there are ways that that activism can come alive, right, in our interpersonal interactions, whatever that looks like in a COVID era. Um, what I would say is, is an idea that I got from ta Coates is around, well, what is the thing that you like to do? You know, not everyone cares about voting. I will tell you voting is not like, I'm not like Stacey Abrams over here where like I live and breathe you know, eradicating voter suppression. That's not where my ministry is, right? So what is your thing? Is it in environment? Is it in education? Is it in healthcare? Is it in storytelling? Um, what is it? And wherever that is, that is where you need to work towards, you know, realizing the hope for racial equity, realizing the hope for gender equity, realizing the hope for ending systemic oppression in our democracy in our everyday lives. And so it's like, it is the hashtags. It's also you finding fulfillment um, and your work in whatever it is that you like to do, whatever your passion is. And moving beyond allyship, allyship has a remove of, oh my gosh, this thing is happening to that person. I don't like that. Let me, you know, stand in alignment with them against that thing, okay? That sounds noble. Thank you so much for your allyship. It can also look like, oh my gosh, that thing is happening to this other person that's not like me at all. I'm pissed about that. That is not in alignment with my values. That is not the institution that I wanna be a part of. I don't wanna be a part of that company team, whatever. I'm pissed about that because that's against my own values. That's the type of work that I'm looking for that you're pissed about racism because racism is bad <laughs> and it hurts everyone, regardless of you know, how you identify. And what I would also like to see, particularly I'm assuming that we're a space of uh, communicators, people who are, are interested in, in narratives, is when we think about you know, this hope for um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris and all the identities and the first that she encompasses, right? First person of color to be in the VP role, first woman to be in the VP role, regardless of race. Um, first, uh, I'm Jamaican, so, you know, raise up for the Jamaicans, you know, someone who identifies as a Black woman, someone who has Jamaican ancestry, someone who has Indian ancestry, you know, first South Asian person of any gender to be in that role too, in that office. And so that's a lot. And we created this kind of messiah complex with Obama that he was going to come and save us from racism, save us from the worst instincts of America. And what that actually triggered was that underbelly, right? That, that, that brood that kind of started popping up and created Trump, right? So Kamala Harris is not going to save us. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need to understand her first, her identity. She's also a politician. She also has a responsibility to represent us. And both she and uh, President-elect Joe Biden have a responsibility to pay what they owe to the black and brown activists and voters and organizers who made Kamala Harris's appointment possible and made their win possible. And paying what you owe means looking at our democracy, our society, who is being the hurt, who is being the most hurt and remedying that, that is how we kind of liberate ourselves as a society. That's how we get closer to our ideals of our democracy. That's how we can start creating trust in institutions by changing those institutions to fundamentally work and support the people who have been most oppressed by those institutions. And what I hear you saying, too, is then maybe don't focus on the polarization, put that energy elsewhere to, and, and, that ang and that anger and frustration. And as you said, being pissed off isn't isn't a bad thing. 
No, absolutely not. I mean, if I, at the end of this presidency said that I spent the last, the, ne- the last four or eight years being mad at people who didn't agree with me or trying to convince people who didn't agree with me, that would be wasted time. In that time, I could have gone deeper and deeper and deeper into the work that fulfills me, into the work that, you know, I know I'm passionate about. I can move the needle in this area, in my area of influence. And we have enough people kind of taking care of their block, right? Then we can actually create change for our whole entire community. That's the type of work that I want to see. In just the few minutes we have left, I'm interested in kind of closing thoughts. And I really feel like we've given everyone something to work with here. You have, I haven't. Um, But thank you, because I think there's been some very specific strategies and advice, and then sort of this deeper dive into how to maybe reframe away from just being, oh my gosh, we're so polarized. Will we ever come together again? What does the future hold, right? Like do something, because that can be paralyzing. So I think especially, Jody, and what you were just saying was sort of like mission driven. Here's something you can do with that in this moment. Um, Akin, where, as you've been listening and and reflecting a final thought or two? Yeah, um, I I think um, we have to uh, work on new literacies. Um, Understanding institutions is really, really important. We talked a lot about uh, government and uh, media, but uh, um, time and time again, trust in particular companies still hold, even though they're not necessarily, um, they have faulty systems. So our also the varied uh, kind of association with trust is something that we have to understand. So a literacy around who institutions are, what they're doing in our lives, in our immediate maybe circles, but then that leads to systemic change uh, uh, by way of an individual person. It's really important. Like what, what are things that are in my institutions that are in my life? government being one of those things um, and what types of kind of um, uh, value proposition impact and effect they have in the world. Um, Something that I have not mentioned, but also something that I'm working on is also expanding again, our kind of bandwidths of time and space. I know I'm a lover of sci-fi, but I don't mean it in that way. Um, And just basically understanding and kind of being avid readers of uh, past experiences, and also global experiences. I still think that there is an opportunity in the US to read more about the world, to follow more about the world, let it be institutions, governments, or um, long-term polarized societies that had uh, um, akin experiences to uh, this moment. Um, so, so that's kind of a survival guide item too, kind of expanding our space and time by way of um, um, understanding uh, different times and p- period around the world and the world itself. So those are my quick two takeaways. Excellent, excellent advice and a very good reminder. It's easy, especially in this country to you know, get very focused on what's happening here and forget about the rest of the world. So thank you for that. Uh, Professor Russell. Sure, I'll just, I'm gonna take a question that wasn't asked. It's uh, from Carol Garza and it's a longer question, but the point is, why is the default not to hold social media accountable? And I'll just close on that. I don't think that we should not hold social media accountable at all. In fact, we have an opening right now with these antitrust hearings and a momentum. Um, And I think that we really need to figure out in addition to all this great advice about doing what we love and mobilizing in the communities that we feel we can contribute to and can strengthen, I think we should also figure out the technology that we want and that we need and get it and put pressure on companies and politicians and policymakers to institute changes so that we aren't caught in this system that isn't working in the public interest. And that's kind of undercutting our efforts at every turn. So that, that I think you know, is something that we should all keep in mind because I think it's become, going to become more prominent um, in the years to come. And we're at the middle of a sort of transition and figuring out what we'll accept as a society and what we want. And I think we should really push for something better than we have. And so often these tools 
they get out ahead of us and the rules have to catch up. And that's kind of where we're at. Um, a final thought or two from you, Jody Ann Beery. Yeah, a final thought here is we're in a space and an opportunity for new narratives. That is what everyone in this room I know either wants, has training in, or, or you know, has the ability to influence. And so as we're trying to survive this post-election, let's think about survival in a different way. Let's think about thriving. Let's think about leveraging, you know, these moments and opportunities for these broader imaginations of what we want to be possible in our democracy. And so if I could just challenge everyone in this room to spend, you know, 15 minutes today and just take that time, you know, shut down all the devices and think about what do you want? What is your freedom dream? What do you want to be true about this country? What conversations do you want to be having? And then figure out your plan on how to make that a reality. I think you've just renamed this a post-election guide to thriving in a time of polarization. So that's a great note to end on. Um, we can all do a collective applause to our panelists. Thank you so much um, for your insights, uh, for your guidance in these times. Also, thank you to all who participated this noon hour. We, we appreciate it. Um, this was a, a joint presentation of the Communication Leadership Program and also the Center for Journalism, Media and Democracy. Um, Akin, any final words before we go? Thank you all for joining us. We'll, um, and I want to thank, uh, on behalf of all of us, also to Austin, who always brings in such a valuable and important perspective to our conversations. And I, I love to brag about the fact that he's an alum of our program, but we learn with all our community members. So thank you, Austin, as well, uh, for facilitating so thoughtfully the conversation uh, today. And to all our community and, to, of course, my fellow panelists, whose opinions I value so much uh, for joining us today uh, to think together. Um, so um, that would be my ending moments. Okay. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks. It was great talking to you all. Okay, I think we are no longer live.